Hi, shalom. Good to see you. My turn, I understand. Huh? Okay. Um, I, you already know who I am, right? Okay. Um, a few days ago, I met uh, one of the leaders of the progressive movement in the, the national progressive movement in this country, one of the leaders of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. You know him, Mayor Bill de Blasio. And Mayor de Blasio told me, you know, my support for Israel and my, my staunch support for Israel and my staunch opposition to boycotting Israel stems from my progressive values. I am pro-Israeli not in spite of the fact that I am progressive, but because of the fact that I am progressive. And he didn't elaborate. But let me elaborate in his place. Why, contrary to all of that is being said in the media, and especially in campus, there is no cause that merits more to be a flag for the progressive movement in this country than Zionism and the State of Israel. You know, Israel was established in 1948, um, in an era in which a lot of uh, national liberation movements across the world, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, prevailed over, over their oppressors. Israel was liberated from the British rule. India was liberated from the British rule. Other countries, at the, Pakistan was liberated from the British rule those, those times. Other countries, at, in the same decade, a decade later, some of them two decades later, like uh, Algeria, Singapore, I am glad to see here see people from Singapore, um, were liberated from French, from Belgian, from Malaysian, from other oppressors. At that time, Kenya, Ghana, we all know the names. At that time, national, national states were the rule. These days, there is a fashion among, uh, in several places in the world that said, okay, at, there was a time in which we needed, they call it ethnocentric countries. Now it's over. So why Israel is a Jewish state? Why do you need a Jewish state? Why are you so adamant that Israel be a Jewish state? And what does it mean, a Jewish state? They said that's reactionary. Let me explain for a minute why Israel is and will keep being a Jewish state for all the right reasons. What is a Jewish state? A Jewish state is a state in which uh, the non-Jews have less rights than the Jews, on the contrary. In a Jewish state, necessarily, because we believe in equality, that is part of our belief in Judaism, every citizen is equal. Does it mean a Jewish state that uh, we are ruled by religious laws, by a Lachic cross, Rabbi Bloom? No. A Jewish state is a state in which uh, the laws are secular, legislated by the Knesset, elected democratically. The Knesset obviously can't take into consideration traditions and, and, and uh, uh, religious rules, but they don't, but the, the legislation is secular. So what the hell is a Jewish state? If not this and not that, what is a Jewish state? And why we are so adamant to keep it that way? 
In spite of the fact that we have, uh, we accommodate in our country, in our state, 20% uh, Arab population, Palestinian population with equal rights. I don't know how to define a Jewish state. The best way I can do, I can do it is giving you an example. And that example of what is a Jewish state is from 1986. In 1986, the Jewish community of Ethiopia was in danger. Um, the whole 20,000 Jews of Ethiopia were gathered in the Israeli embassy compound in Addis Ababa. The rebels were already in the gates of Addis Ababa, and the Jews were desperate to come to Israel. They tried it earlier, walking through the desert in Sudan, but the Sudanese crossed the border. They couldn't come to Israel. Israel those days had a prime minister named Yitzhak Shamir. Yitzhak Shamir called someone to his office, the chief executive officer of El Al, our airline. And he told him, sir, please cancel all the flights, all the commercial flights of El Al in the next 72 hours. The guy, <laughs> Prime Minister, the, you are asking me something impossible. We have dozens and dozens of flights to New York and to Bangkok, to London and to Los Angeles. We can't do that. He said, you had no choice. That's my order. And not only that, I order you also to strip all the aircrafts from their seats to make more room to civilians, to human beings. And in 48 hours, Elal rescued, flew, flew back and forth from Tel Aviv to Addis Ababa and rescued in 48 hours the entire Jewish community of Addis Ababa, of Ethiopia. Now, would we have done that for a non-Jewish community? I assume we would have participated in the effort. We are the first to rush to Haiti when there is an earthquake in Haiti. We'd send the largest contingent of any other country to Mexico after the last earthquake. We would have participated, yes, but we wouldn't go to that effort. But the, most inter the more interested country is, would have any other country participate in the rescue of the Ethiopian Jewry? Unfortunately, we know the answer. No. How do we know the answer? Because we were there. We were there in the 40s, when the Jewish population of Europe was decimated, and no country, no country whatsoever, except for the Dominican Republic that showed good, good intentions but couldn't deliver, no country came to our rescue. That's the reason we need a Jewish state. Can we be sure that it will not happen again? Look at Charlottesville. How can we be sure after Charlottesville? Look at Tehran. How can we be sure after when we hear, we listen to the words coming from Tehran? And that's the reason we need a Jewish state. I will never give up the idea of a Jewish state. If that, the salvation of human beings, is not a progressive cause, I don't know what a progressive cause is. During the second half of the 20th century, there have been a lot of successful national liberation movements. I mentioned a few, India, Kenya, Algeria. I dare to say that all of them, all the, all of them were justified. Fight against colonialism is always justified. But none of them, none of them was as, as extraordinary and as just as the national liberation movement of the Jewish people that brought upon the creation of the State of Israel. And that national liberation movement has a name, the Z word, the Zionism. One of the words that today are most vilified, 
are most distorted, and I believe we have a duty to restore the honor of that word. I think that <laughs> incidentally, when people tell you in this campus and in other places that lie about Israeli apartheid, remind them. In Operation Solomon in 1986, which I just described, Israel was the first, until now the only country in history, the only country I can remember in history, that sent a fleet to Africa to liberate black African rather than to enslave them. All other countries that we know in history sent huge fleets to Africa to enslave Africans. Israel is the only country in the world that sent a fleet to liberate black Africans and to bring them to safety and to absorb them as an integral part of our society. And then they say, look, uh, but your democracy sucks. Well, that's right, our democracy sucks. Democracy is a messy form of government. People shout and express their opinions, sometimes not in a very civilized manner. Well, I can understand that those that admire the democracy of uh, Hugo Chavez and uh, Nicolas Maduro in this campus don't like uh, Israeli democracy. And those that uh, will never say a word against the butcher of Damascus or the genocidal of Tehran don't like our democracy. Our democracy is not perfect. No, demo no form of government is perfect. By the way, I don't want to brag. I think as our democracy, I have to be careful. I, want, I don't want to be expelled from this country. I am a foreign diplomat. My visa depends on the State Department. But really, I think that our democracy is, has, is better than American. I mean, you, for instance, you don't have to register to vote in Israel. Therefore, there, is no such, there cannot be such a thing as voter suppression in Israel, which is a common, they say, a common practice in Israel. In the United States, again, I want to be very careful against debilitated, against African Americans. It can't happen in Israel. Um, some will think it's an advantage, some will think it's a disadvantage, but we don't have an electoral college in which a, a candidate gets less votes and is elected president. So, as imperfect as our democracy is, I think we can be quite proud of it. And think about it. When they tell you about the fallacies about our democracy, think about it. Israeli democracy is actually a miracle. Israel was formed in war. Most countries don't maintain a democracy when they are in war, let alone they not create a democracy when they are in war. And more than that, think about it. Israel was created mainly by two groups of persons devoid completely of any democratic legacy. Jews from Eastern Europe and Jews from the Middle East. They didn't know what it is to live in a democratic society. Nevertheless, and in spite of the war, and in spite of the being many of them refugees, they created the democracy. It was clear for them that the Jewish state will be a democracy. Show me another example of, of that, more progressive than that. But they say, okay, but you mistreat the Arab in Israel. Well, I can spend two hours uh, uh, showing how that is uh, nonsense, but I will give you just one example that you might remind. We had a president, 
You know, the president in Israel is not a real president. He's a, a figurehead like the Queen of England. Um, with all due respect. Um, we had a president, his name was Moshe Katsav. While in the presidency, while being president, we discovered the police, that the guy is a sexual predator. Very unpleasant situation. Well, we are a democracy. He was brought to justice. He comes to the court, and who is the judge? George Kara, an Arab. So we now were apartheid, an Arab magistrate, an Arab judge, judges the Jewish president of the Jewish state, and sends him to jail for seven years. Now you would say, if Israel is an apartheid country, a racist society, you can be sure that the, this George Kara guy, this judge, was for sure fired after that trial. Well, he actually was promoted to our Supreme Court. A very peculiar apartheid regime. And then they say, okay, okay, but the Palestinians, the occupation. And let's analyze it for a bit without all the prejudice and misinformation that is being spread. Guys, if there is one constant pattern in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that pattern is that since 1936 till this very day, every single peace proposal of partition of two states, call it whichever name, is the same. Every single proposal that was put on the table was accepted by the State of Israel, even before its inception by the Zionist movement, and was rejected by the Palestinian National Movement. That is a fact. It started in 1936 when the British sent the Royal Commission. You know, we are going to celebrate on next, this year actually, not next year. This year we're going to celebrate our 70th anniversary of independence. Why, does, why doesn't the state of Palestine also going to celebrate this year its 70th anniversary of independence? Actually, because one word, because of one word. When the UN proposed them, offered them, to establish the state of Palestine side by side with the state of Israel, they said, instead of saying yes, they said no. That's the only reason they are not going to celebrate their 70th anniversary of independence together with us. We could have a beautiful joint celebration and save a few bucks. And that happened again and again. You know, for 19 years, the so-called West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, including the Jewish sacred places in Jerusalem, were under, in Arab hands. They could have established a state alongside Israel. Any single day of those 19 days. Again, one word. No, in this case, two words. Instead of a state, they decided to establish a terrorist organization to fight Israel. That's the only reason a Palestinian state wasn't established. And again in 2000, when Bill Clinton offered them, offered us his peace deal, we accepted, they rejected, and then in 2008, in 2008 actually is no words, that's interesting. In 2008, our Prime Minister Ehud Olmert called Mahmoud Abbas, the President of the Palestinian Authority, and presented him the most far-reaching peace deal you can imagine. 
I will not get into all the details, I will give you just one example. Jerusalem. They used to say that Jerusalem is the most difficult issue. In Jerusalem, about Jerusalem, the holy basin of Jerusalem, the sacred places in Jerusalem for the three large monotheist religions, this guy, Eud Olmert, our prime minister, offered Abbas to establish a special governing, governing body composed of five states, three of them Muslim. Three out of five, unless you are a lawyer that can't distort anything, it's a majority. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Jordan, the State of Palestine that was to be established according to that proposal, the State of Israel, and the fifth, I'm not sure if the US or the Vatican. A majority. In this case, it's not one word. In what what separated between the establishment of uh, the state of Palestine and its non-establishment is zero words. Mahmoud Abbas actually disappeared. He didn't return the calls. Many months later, he went to the Washington Post and said the gaps were too wide. He did never explain why the, why the gaps were too wide. So, you know, when I see in Colombia or in other places in front of my diplomatic mission, ba a banner saying, end the occupation, I say to myself, okay, let's end the occupation. How? There are three ways to end the occupation, the so-called occupation, or not so-called, doesn't matter. The first one is the way that I assume they want those that hold those, those banners to dismantle Israel. One Israeli go, will go to Poland, the other Israeli will go to Canada, a third one will go to Argentina, a fourth one will go to Yemen, and then barred from entry the, to enter this country according to the travel ban. Um, well, that will not happen. We will not dismantle Israel. The second way is unilateral withdrawal. We will withdraw from Judea and Samaria, the so-called AKA West Bank and, and, and East Jerusalem from Gaza, we already withdrew without peace, but there's going to be no occupation. Well, the problem is that we tried that. We tried that in the summer of 2005. We withdrew from Gaza and we took from there everything, our civilians, our militaries, and that's as terrible as it sounds, we disinterred our dead and brought them to burial again in, in Jerusalem. Because we knew what will happen to those corpses if we leave them there. And what was the result? The result was that the Gazans were given a, 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 a a choice that is seldom given to a group of persons. They were given the choice to become a Middle Eastern Singapore, thriving, successful, beautiful. I have to return to Singapore. I have been there more than 20 years ago. Um, and, um, or a Middle Eastern Somalia. And they decided. It's not bad luck. They decided that they want to continue the war against Israel from Gaza, and every single penny, every single yen, every single dollar, every single pound that was euro that was generously contributed to them for tunnels, attacking tunnels, for missiles, for, 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 for war, instead of schools and hospitals. Now understand, if the same happens without peace in, in Judea and Samaria, a.k.a. the West Bank, the area surrounding Judea and Samaria is, is all of Israel. It's our only, only international airport, Ben Gurion Airport, is, is Tel Aviv, is Jerusalem, is everything. Who will land in Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv if there, every 15 year old with a rocket launcher in his shoulder can shoot down an aircraft? So we cannot permit that. And the third way is, of course, uh, a negotiated agreement. But every time we brought, they came to the negotiating table, and that by itself is very rare, 
Their demands were actually to convert Israel into a second Palestinian state by flooding it with Palestinians. Descendants of, fifth generation descendants of people that left the area. So, of course, they want to make peace, a Palestinian state with another Palestinian state, or at least a binational state. Well, that will not happen. I mean, peace they have to do with us, with the Jews. So, again, we made our share of injustices. We still do. In a 100-year conflict, there is no country that does not make injustices. Guantanamo, uh, drones that kill in Afghanistan, um, participants in a wedding or in a funeral, Abu Ghraib in Iraq, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. We do our share of injustices, unfortunately, and you know what? We do also our share of stupidities. But in the big picture, we have by far, by far, the upper moral hand, deserving again to be the banner of the progressive movement in this country. And finally, what defines a country, it's not its richness, its wealth. Israel is a wealthy country today. Um, our GDP per capita skyrocketed in the last two decades, in the last decade, and now it's surpassing that. We already surpassed the GDP per capita of Italy, and now we are approaching, and maybe as we are speaking, we already surpassed the GDP per capita of Japan. We are doing extremely well these days. But the question is, what do you do with your wealth? And I want to tell you two things among many that Israel does with its wealth. The first one, I am proud to say that Israel is the only country in the world, the only one, that extends humanitarian assistance to Syrian citizens inside Syria. Enemy citizens, and we don't ask questions. Um, at the beginning, we even take the pain of erasing the labels with, in, with Hebrew inscriptions in the clauses we supply the Syrians, but now it became a kind of uh, having a, 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 an Israeli code became a kind of status symbol in Syria. So we, we stopped doing that. No other country does it. As we speak, is young Israeli men and women with uniform and without uniform are endangering their lives in order to supply medicines and clothes and construction materials to Syrian citizens. No other country does it. And the second one is what we are doing in Africa. And I want to say a few words about Africa, if we have time, two or three minutes. Our relation with Africa was bumpy. We were very supportive of the nascent countries of Africa in the 60s, in the early 70s, and then something happened. Uh, the Saudis, the Libyans, the, the oil-producing countries exerted extreme pressure, blackmail on the Africans, and all the African countries actually cut their relations with Israel, except for two, I think, uh, Malawi and Swaziland. Now we are returning to Africa in an unprecedented way, and Africa is returning to Israel. And we are doing, uh, uh, helping Africa. Last year, Prime Minister Netanyahu, by the way, Prime Minister Netanyahu visited uh, during the last year Rwanda and Ethiopia and Uganda and Kenya and Liberia, and he means to, 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 to visit Togo and uh, many others. Um, I was, when Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the UN General Assembly, he convened on the sidelines of that, uh, of the General Assembly, a summit with 12 African leaders. And Israeli companies presented the uh, innovative technologies that help these days Africa. For instance, uh, 
this device that converts the humidity in there into drinking water for places that are there is no access to drinking water that is used today widely in Africa. And uh, you will excuse me, ladies, even they presented uh, a do-it-yourself circumcision tool. You know that circumcision is helpful to prevent uh, STD, sexually transmitted diseases. So Prime Minister Netanyahu said that it is uh, cutting-edge technology. <laughs> and the president of Rwanda said that uh, this is a very sensitive issue. Um, but those are things that Israel is doing today with its wealth to help humanity. In Hebrew, we call it tikkun olam, repairing the world. And I am proud to represent a country that uses its wealth for those uh, purposes. To sum up and to conclude, look, in a few weeks, I don't know exactly, we are going to have here the Israel Apartheid Week and all that crap. <laughs> um, you know, we are used to that in history. Something very interesting happened the other day. There is this uh, woman from Brooklyn. Her name is Linda Sarsour. And she wrote an article in which she said, you cannot be both a feminist and a Zionist. OK. The following day, just a coincidence. They, I don't think they speak with each other. The following day, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, tweeted, feminism is an invention of the Zionists. <laughs> now we are used to that, for for not for centuries, for millennia. For millennia, we are used to this couple of persons. One accuses the Jews of being the Inventors of, the inventors of fascism, the other accuses the Jews of being the inventors of, anti, of uh, communism. One uh, uh, um, accuses the, the Jews of being uh, uh, wealthy, the other uh, accuses the Jew of stinking, uh, the poverty and stinking and uh, never bath. So we are, we are used to those uh, duos of persons that accuse um, Jews, in this case Zionism, of one thing and the opposite. And always remember, those duos, those couples, have a name. And the name is anti-Semites. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Yeah, um, your name? My name is Anat. Anat. Hi, Anat. Hi. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned Algier as an example for a country that was uh, freed from oppression. Algier was freed from the French occupation after eight years of violent resistance. Do you think the Palestinians have the same chance? That's one. Uh, second, you are so proud, and we're all very proud, by the achievements of Israel. Do you think that the great, rich country of Israel can't handle 30, 40,000 refugees and asylum seekers from Africa, that she, it deports them now? Mm -hmm. OK, so the first question, um, look, uh, there is no basis for comparison between Algeria and, and, and Israel. And, Israel. Um, and you know, I think that is the basic question of the conflict. We always speak about the symptoms of the conflict. The symptoms of the conflict are terrorism, um, settlements you mentioned. No, you didn't mention, but I, I did. Um, uh, the the, the, the uh, inability to speak with each other, etc., etc. But those are symptoms. What is the conflict about? Why there is a conflict? There is a conflict because we Israelis know and educate that in the same small patch of land the size of New Jersey that we call Eretz Israel and our neighbors call Palestine, 
but it's the same thing. Like Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, it's the same thing. In that small patch of land that we call Eretz Israel and they call Palestine, we know that there are two ethnic groups that are indigenous to it, the Jews and the Palestinians. The Palestinians educate that there is only one, them. And we are European, late 19th century colonialist project. I don't have to guess. Mahmoud Abbas said it in his famous or infamous speech a few weeks ago. You know, Anat, uh, when that will change, when Palestinians will come to terms with the fact that we are not French in Algeria, we are indigenous to Eretz Israel exactly like they are indigenous to Palestine, that day the peace process will begin. <laughs> Until then, in Hebrew, you understand Hebrew, obviously. In Hebrew, we call it full gas ben uh, All the peace process is a mirage, is a farce. And I want to add something more. Unfortunately, the Palestinians are going the opposite way. They are educating more and more and more that we are a colonialist project, we heard. Abu Mazen, but you know, I was a year ago in the Holocaust, in the International Remembrance Day of the Holocaust in a synagogue in, in, in Manhattan, and the keynote speaker was the then new elected Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Antonio Guterres from Portugal. And Mr. Guterres said, quote, the temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem in the year 70 AC was a Jewish one. Nothing more, unquote. No political conclusion, nothing. What happened the next day? The Palestinian envoy to the UN presented a strong protest. He demanded that the Secretary General retract his statement and he said that it was offensive to the Palestinian people. So, you know, Anat, I think that, uh, you know who is the most important person in the peace process? Erroneously, people think that the President uh, of the United States or the Secretary General of the UN, or the Prime Minister of Israel. Once Al Jazeera said that I am as the leader then of Yesha. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, not even the President of the Palestinian Authority. The most important person in the peace process is the Minister of Education of the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> when they will start to educate that we also have rights, not just power, but rights, then all the other issues, you will be surprised how forthcoming the Israeli public will become. Regarding the second question, yes, we can. Um, but it creates certain problems that uh, we do not want to deal with. Um, and also, uh, you know, respect for the, for the rule of law. So right now a decision has been made to, uh, regarding those uh, 34,000, no, not 34,000, sorry, Ma much less than that because we are talking only about uh, single, per single men in the years 20 and 40. I don't think that there are more than, I don't know, 10,000 or so. Um, I, I hear the smear campaign going on uh, regarding that. It's a disinformation campaign. I hope it will not succeed. My name is Sammy Steigman. We all uh, know you. Thank you. For the people that don't know me. But uh, on January 31st, uh, when they had the International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, I believe that uh, Danny Danone okay, mentioned that uh, the UN admitted they passed a resolution that uh, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism. I just wanted to know if you can confirm that. Yeah, the Secretary General said that, the President of France said that, and many other countries said that uh, singling out Israel for opposition to, singling out Jews for the right to self-determination is a, is a form of anti-Semitism. But you know, you re reminded uh, my colleague Danny Danone, our 
uh, the head of our uh, delegation to the UN. My name is Danny Dayan. There is quite a, a confusion between both of us. We sit in the same building. Uh, um, uh, I get his emails, uh, he gets my phone calls. But the most annoying thing was when I sent uh, flowers to this lady and he got the thank you note. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Noah. Um, so BDS and various Palestinian supporters seem to be a lot more aggressive and, and frankly kind of rude than a lot of the pro-Israeli groups on campus. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed protesters outside and you mentioned the um, you know, apartheid week. Um, do you think we should become, uh, being pro-Israelis, uh, do you think we should become kind of more aggressive or maintain the status quo and, and a moral high ground? Well, you know, I will be careful to use the word aggressive. Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by aggressive. Uh, uh, you have to be, uh, you know, I was in, uh, first of all, I was, uh, uh, last year I was in, uh, in another campus in, in a city college of New York, and, and the guys from SJP and others uh, were in the, in the room and made some, you know, what they usually do. And uh, later I told the president of the college, look, I am not concerned about my freedom of speech. I have many venues to express myself. And as you can see, I am not too concerned about my safety, <laughs> my physical safety. Uh, but I am uh, concerned about your freedom of speech and your physical sp uh, uh, safety, uh, the attempts to intimidate you. And uh, any attempt to intimidate pro-Israel groups in campuses in New York, I want to know about it. And uh, 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 you have every right to exert your, your rights to, to your First Amendment rights and, uh, and to not to be intimidated. Now, I want to say a word about BDS. Sometimes, I, my, my, uh, uh, I will confess to you that BDS is not among the top priorities in my mission. I think that BDS uh, outside campus is, a, is a, a miserable failure. Look at Israeli, the, the economy side of BDS. Look, the, you know, the, the Israeli economy is thriving. One uh, researcher uh, made an index of the companies that, the, 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 the share value of the companies, the market value of the companies that were targeted by BDS, like HP and Caterpillar and others, and they rose above the, the average. That means that the BDS, the economic BDS of Israel was, uh, is a total failure. Now the cultural BDS, I, I don't know if you have been lately to Tel Aviv, but uh, every, every single performer that you want to hear in Tel Aviv, uh, you can even, it's for the oldies like uh, Cliff Richards or for the younger. Uh, there is one nodnik named Roger Waters. We can live without Roger Waters. He convinced the 19-year-old from New Zealand. Okay, we can manage that. You know, sometimes I wish BDS to be more successful. We already suffered three times Justin Bieber. <laughs> Justin, it was a joke. You are welcome. Uh, good evening, Mr. Diane. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm a student, uh, first year in Colombia. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from Bangladesh. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Operation Solomon, the very brave endeavor by the Israeli government, and asked a very important question, like if the Ethiopian people were not Jews, would Israel or any other state would have participated in that humanitarian action? Well, I said, so, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Just, uh, I would say yes, and there's an example. Ethiopia and Israel are like, 4,000 kilometers apart. So in 1971, Israel did send a lot of aid indirectly, directly, to a country which is 5,500 kilometers away from Israel, away, farther away from Ethiopia, and that was Bangladesh. So yeah, Israel, the state of Israel does care for the non-Jews, 
And if you want to talk about a uh, more recent issue, I just read this, that uh, there's an issue in Bangladesh about the uh, Rohingya refugees. Right, the state thing. of Israel did uh, offer some aid to, you know, for take better care of the refugees, but the government of Bangladesh had to refuse for political sensitivity. But again, uh, the point is, I want to make is that the state of Israel does care for both the Jews and the non-Jews. No doubt, uh, we, we participate. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we, we are the first to participate in any humanitarian effort in the world. Uh, of course, much further than Ethiopia. Uh, I, I mentioned Haiti. We established the field hospital in Haiti that was state of the art. Uh, uh, no other country, uh, the U.S. is so close to Haiti, but no other country did for Haiti what we did. For Mexico, as I said, we sent recently the largest contingent of any other country in the world, larger than the U.S. that is, uh, 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 has a limit, has a border with Mexico without a wall uh, for the time being. Um, 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 Nepal, Turkey, etc., etc. And I can tell you more than that, Supanta. As we speak now, um, you're right, for, for, for reasons that are beyond our control, uh, the, the Bangladeshi uh, authorities' decision, Israel does not officially operate in helping the, Roh the Rohingya uh, um, people from Myanmar in, in Bangladesh, the refugees. But I can assure you that Israelis are there, and Israeli NGOs are working in Bangladesh, assisting the Rohingya in uh, cooperation with the uh, Bangladeshi humanitarian NGOs. What I am saying now, I am not guessing, is a fact. Okay, um, we're gonna take two more questions, and I'm gonna take the advantage of taking one. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit of having the microphone. Um, we can give an example of, of a coexistence in Israel, of speaking about a community that accepts Israel as part of, the, of that country, um, the Druze community. It's a, it's a different community than the Israelis that is actually striving and becoming a very integral part of the Israeli community. What do you think Which was- Which community, sorry? The Druze. The Druze, of course. What do you think was so significantly different there that made the difference? Well, simply, uh, I don't know, everyone know what the Druze are? Okay. Um, uh, the Druze make a decision. The Druze make a decision to integrate uh, completely uh, into uh, the fabric of the Israeli society. And uh, if I were a Druze, I would think that is the best decision my leaders ever made for me. Um, you know, uh, Israel is a democracy. We don't have exactly the, uh, the, uh, the First Amendment because we don't have a written constitution, but the uh, freedom of speech obviously is guaranteed in Israel. And when we see uh, in Arab villages and towns in Israel um, demonstrations sometimes on completely civil matters, civilian matters like building or sewage or, or, or uh, things like that, and instead of Israeli flags, uh, Palestinian flags are raised, well, that creates immediately a kind of uh, hard feelings in the Israeli society. Uh, the Druze society made a, a very clever decision to completely integrate into the fabric of the Israeli society, and I think that uh, it was a very wise one. We had the privilege to host here uh, just uh, two weeks ago the spiritual leader of the Druze community, the Sheik um, Tarif, and he said that uh, exactly. By the way, it goes beyond that uh, because of the the close links that and the the, the mutual um, the mutual responsibility that Jews and Druze have for each other, even in a situation a very strange situation in Syria in which the Druze uh, in Syria cooperate with our enemies, with Iran and, and Hezbollah. But we didn't allow uh, their being hurt by, by the Syrian opposition. And we even threatened to intervene to, to, to save them when the, the situation was delicate. 
Okay, uh, one last question. Um, how do you think that the declaration of the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem will both affect the, Israel's diplomatic relationships in terms of other countries and also how, how will it affect the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, you know, uh, beforehand, before President Trump announced uh, finally his decision to move the embassy and to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, yeah, there was, uh, he was in, in, in the Oval Office already, I think, uh, a year or so, almost a an year. And people asked me a lot, uh, look, uh, they were terribly worried. What will happen if the U.S. decides to move the embassy to Jerusalem? And my response will, was always, simply, the American embassy will be in Jerusalem. That's the only thing that will happen. Uh, all the alarmist scenarios, uh, as in many, many cases, were nonsense. We have a few weeks, a few days of rage, but you know, someone said uh, you can, when the Palestinians declare every single day of rage, uh, you could believe that the other days are days of yoga. Uh, they, every day uh, they have uh, an excuse to declare it a day of rage. Uh, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Um, regarding the outcome, the, 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 the influence on the in future negotiations, etc., etc., first we, have, we hope that the Palestinians finally will come to the negotiating table. You know that if Prime Minister Netanyahu now jumps into his car and starts driving from his, of his office in Jerusalem towards Ramallah, and President Abbas jumps into his car and starts driving from his office in Ramallah towards Jerusalem, they will meet in the middle of the road, in the middle of the way, in exactly eight minutes. And it's, uh, it's tragic that uh, in spite of all the offers by Netanyahu to negotiate without preconditions, uh, uh, instead of negotiating, he uses more and more inflammatory rhetoric, uh, Abbas. But uh, contrary to what many pundits said here in, and elsewhere, I think that the moving of the embassy is a contribution to the peace process uh, because it makes clear what is not on the table. And it uh, deflates uh, fantasies that were not uh, achievable for the Palestinians. Uh, Jerusalem is, was, is, and will be the capital of Israel. So everybody, thank you for coming here, and thank you to Danny Dayan for joining us tonight. Good thank night. you. to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.